We are on the Health Watch today, digging into a new study about men and cancer in the decades ahead. Ann Makovic is here with some pretty stark numbers for us. Ann? Yeah, we are talking about a major jump in the number of cancer cases diagnosed over the next 25 years. This is according to a new study from the University of Queensland Cancer Research Center. Now, one obvious reason is that there will be more people in the world, and the population is also getting older, but this is beyond that. The study estimates that by 2050, cancer cases amongst men worldwide will increase by 84%, and cancer deaths among men will increase by 93%. CBS News Chief Medical Correspondent Dr. John LaPoupe talked about potential reasons for the projected jump. One reason is a different in exposure. So you have certain cancer risk factors, for example, cigarette smoking and alcohol consumption is higher in men than in women. There are other possible culprits like exposure to environmental toxins, genetic factors, and willingness to participate in cancer screenings. The good news is that many of these cancers, about 40% in a recent U.S. study, are preventable. So what lifestyle changes can people make to try to prevent cancer? Here is Dr. LaPook's advice. By far, not smoking is the single most important thing. You know, it turns out that about 30% of cancer deaths in the United States are from smoking. And after that, exercising, maintaining a healthy body weight, limiting red meat and processed foods, as well as alcohol, uh, these all can help reduce your risks. And while doctors encourage healthy habits, Dr. LaPook also wanted to get this message out. I don't want people to feel guilty. There are more than two, about two million people a year in 2024 are, are predicted to have cancer. Yeah. Okay, we're not done with the year yet. So I don't want people out there who have cancer to say, oh, it was something I did. Right, I think that's right. really important. But you can so create some discipline power. in your life and reduce those rates. So lung cancer is expected to continue to be the driver here when it comes to cancer cases in men and when it comes to cancer deaths. Some of the other types of cancers on the rise right now with men is cases of mesothelioma and also deaths by prostate cancer. The study also mentions that one way to help would be to have a more robust health care system. Liz. All right, Ann, thanks so much. Well, this week, President Biden announced new funding for his Moonshot Cancer Initiative. It's a $150 million grant for eight U.S. research teams that are working on ways to help surgeons successfully remove cancerous tumors. President Biden says his goal is to cut America's cancer death rate in half by 2050. Now, there's been a lot of cancer research over the decades already. Coming up, we ask a UCSF oncologist about the progress they're seeing here in the Bay Area and what to believe when it comes to diets and cancer prevention. Plus, a warning for patients dealing with those health care bills, why some advocates are calling a certain payment method a trap. Researchers are warning that cancer in men is expected to skyrocket over the next 25 years. Joining me now is UCSF oncologist, Dr. Jeffrey Buckle. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Now, this news was surprising, at least to me, only because each year there seems to be a new development, a new treatment for all types of cancer. Were you surprised by the findings of this study, given the progress of cancer research? Yeah, I think you highlight we're making incredible progress in terms of developing novel therapies and different strategies of treating patients that have a higher likelihood of achieving cure while minimizing toxicity. I think one of the challenges, though, is we're seeing shifts in the population and different risk factors. And so a lot of ways that uh, the, the pattern is not surprising at all, that there's more cancer cases, more amongst the old. And uh, I think one alarming piece is also an increasing incidence among young that's not well understood. Yeah, I mean, I want to talk about that because we reported that younger people are being di diagnosed with cancer, specifically colon cancer, and in many cases, lung cancer. Why do you think that is? Are we getting better at detecting it? I think to some extent we are detecting better, but I think there really is a signal of increasing incidence irrespective of our, of our diagnostic capabilities. Um, unfortunately, we haven't found one smoking gun that's explained why there's such a drive, like drive and incidence amongst both, um, you know, colon and lung. Um, one of the thoughts is probably obesity, probably sedentary behaviors and different lifestyle exposures. Amongst lung cancer, it's thought to be air pollution and other forms of radiation. Um, and I guess one that I overlooked is also the microbiome amongst the young. It's a lot harder to study and kind of harder to prove that there's a single driving factor, but it 
it's definitely something that's being researched and starting to, to show signs of um, a possible explanation, which would be very helpful in terms of uh, cancer control programming. Absolutely. I'm curious, what's your opinion on some of these so-called cancer preventative diets? We've talked a lot about the benefits, of course, of Mediterranean diet, but now a new study out of UCSF is showing promising um, findings in the ketogenic diet, which is high fat, high protein, and treating pancreatic cancer. What do you make of using specific diets to mitigate risk? Do you think these have legs? I think there is truth to, so there's a lot of data to support um, the role of cancer, specific diets in, in terms of reducing the risk of cancer. You know, eating lots of vegetables, fruits, avoiding um, red meats and processed grains, focusing on whole grains, um, fish and poultry are all things that can reduce cancer risk. Um, I think there's a distinction between adopting very specific diets during cancer treatment. For example, keto, ketogenic diets um, are associated or have signals that suggest that they might be helpful over the course of cancer treatment or once patients are diagnosed. But there's a lot more research that uh, needs to be done to show that they're ready for prime time or essentially recommending during the course of cancer treatment. Yeah, and the study talks a lot about lifestyle choices as being a big contributor to a person's cancer risk. A lot of people watching this right now may not see themselves as living a risky life. They're not necessarily obese. They may have a glass of wine at the end of the night, maybe a beer, or maybe they have fast food once a week. Should those habits really be eliminated? I mean, I guess what I'm saying is the window for the so-called moderation lifestyle, is that narrowing? Yeah, that's a great question. And this is an issue that's really difficult to offer counsel in terms of you know complete confidence in changing behavior. It's really impossible to demonstrate that any level of exposure has zero risk. Um, researchers have thus far concluded that there really is no minimal amount of, of uh, alcohol intake that's safe, meaning any exposure is associated with a slight increased risk of cancer. There may be other areas, for example, um, you know, red meats occasionally that may or may not be associated with, you know, um, driving cancer risk if you do very sporadically. I think important message is that obviously, you know, people want to live their life and it's important to be able to do so, but acknowledging kind of what are the unhealthy habits, what are the healthy habits, and then for those unhealthy habits that you choose to kind of continue, do everything in moder moderation as much as possible. All right, Dr. Jeffrey Buckle with UCSF, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. A major development today that could help people pay for their cancer treatments and treatments of other issues like diabetes and even heart disease. The Biden administration says it's managed to cut the prices of the 10 most widely used Medicare drugs. After talks with drug makers, the White House says the savings will range from 38 percent to 79 percent. The new prices will kick in in 2026 and starting in 2025, out-of-pocket drug costs will be capped at $2,000 for people with Medicare Part D. And Americans owe about $220 billion in medical debt, and the government has proposed rules to prevent that debt from hurting somebody's current credit score. But that doesn't include medical credit cards, which a lot more people are using these days. CBS's Anna Werner has the warning from consumer advocates before you open that account. I applied put the exact amount of what my procedure cost. Mary E. Menina was so concerned about her experience with a medical credit card, she highlighted it on TikTok. I'm going to tell you what happened so this never happens to you. Imanina says it began last year when she went to an orthodontist to get Invisalign braces. The price, $4,500 up front. She says the office gave her a couple payment plan options. Put $1,000 down and get a plan through the doctor's office, or she could sign up for what's called care credit that offered no down payment plus no interest for 18 months. You don't have to put anything down, which is really what caught my attention. Care Credit, owned by Synchrony Financial, is advertised as a way to pay for health and wellness at over 270,000 locations across the United States. The company's website does mention it's a credit card, but because it's often pitched during doctor's appointments by health professionals, some consumers, including Imanina, don't realize it's a credit card like any other. I didn't really know that it was an actual credit card. I thought for some reason it would come out uh, on my credit report as like a loan of some sort. After making her first payment, Imanina says, she checked her credit report and was surprised to see... It dropped my credit score 50 points. She says the card appeared on her report as a nearly maxed out credit card, hurting her score. Not only that, but she says she realized the proposed payment schedule set up by Care Credit wouldn't cover her total costs in the 18-month promotional period, meaning she'd eventually owe interest as well. 
If I was paying the only the minimum payment, the interest would have applied to my account. An interest rate of 32.99%. The payment they initially gave you that they automatically calculated was not enough to keep you in the interest-free zone? No, it wasn't. She's right. There online, in the fine print of the credit card agreement, it says the required minimum monthly payments may or may not pay off your purchase by the end of the promotional period. And if it's not paid in full by then, the company will tack on a lump sum interest charge when the promotion period runs out. What do you think of that? I think it's pretty sneaky. Medical credit cards can be extremely harmful to consumers. Chi Chi Wu is with the National Consumer Law Center. Her group warns medical credit cards can have higher interest rates than other credit cards and calls those deferred interest plans deceptive. There's no interest for six months or one year, but you have to pay off the entire balance by the end of that six months or one year. And if you don't pay off the balance, interest is accruing in the background and it'll be slapped on the account after that six months or one year, which is really can be a trap for consumers. Synchrony financial officials push back on those characterizations, telling CBS News there's nothing deceptive about Care Credit's deferred interest program, that the rules are exceptionally transparent, the deferred interest promotions are popular and well understood by consumers, and the company follows all applicable federal regulations. But this California state senator says... Most consumers don't realize, wow, I just took out another credit card. Monique Limon is sponsoring legislation that would ban credit reporting agencies from factoring medical debt, including from medical credit cards, into a consumer's credit report or score. Medical debt shouldn't be treated the way that other type of debt is treated, and it shouldn't be reported to a credit agency where then it can have an impact on your ability to buy a home, your ability to rent, your ability to get a car. All of these things are really key things that people need. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is now examining how financial institutions market their products to health care providers in the wake of complaints from patients. Synchrony officials told us they made the promotional features clear to Imanina. They also said the cards are not designed to be used for large-scale catastrophic health costs, but provide another way for consumers to pay off less expensive procedures over time. Still ahead, a focus on the health of young men and boys. Meet a man who is traveling the world to help them focus on their mental health. Now, we know that physical health is important to help prevent cancer and other ailments, but experts are also seeing a growing focus on mental health, and some are putting the spotlight on the emotional well-being of boys in particular. Javar Godfrey is a mo motivational speaker with a background in social work. He travels the world helping young men talk about their mental health. On this day, he visited a New Jersey middle school. Like, I feel like for me, I, get, I, I don't feel comfortable. I, I just want to like deal with my own problems. So why this specific focus on young men, young boys, and their mental health? Well, uh, mainly because I want the conversation to become normal. And where they often don't get these times to just sit and discuss just their emotions and how they feel um, without being judged. Doctors say there needs to be more discussion about how to help boys communicate. And they say it's critical that we recognize the signs of struggle can be different for boys than they are for girls. Depression can also show up more as irritable or angry behavior or outbursts, whereas girls may show up as more sullen or sad. Now, doctors' advice to adults, be open early and often to talk about emotional health and well-being, not just when there's an immediate concern. We'll be right back. And thank you so much for joining us for today's important conversation about cancer and men and ways to try to prevent it. We'd love to hear what you think. Are you changing any of your daily habits to try to stay healthy? Post your thoughts online using the hashtag KPIX. The CBS Evening News is next. Local news continues on our streaming service, CBS News Bay Area. I'll see you at 5.
To view more content like this, we've selected some videos we think you'll enjoy. And please make sure to like and click the link in the bottom left corner to subscribe.